again, a very warm welcome to our second episode of the Leaders for Humanity series. And uh, again, uh, with my co-host, Antoinette, we are extremely, extremely proud and happy to have with us another stunning thinker of our times, Emanuele Quintarelli, who is a senior advisor in all sorts of organizational development, as you will hear in the next one and a half hours. So Emanuele, uh, great to have you here and a warm welcome. My pleasure and thank you so much for having me here. Superb. And people who have followed our first edition will already know a little bit what we're doing on this, um, this series. We will try to go through a number of interesting topics. So first and foremost, we will give you a little bit of background on what this series is about and how it connects to the larger program or project, which is called Good Organizations. We will then introduce Emanuele properly, and you will learn a little bit more about Emanuele and what he, what he thinks um, about life and work. And then we will go into the core topic of today's episode, which is really about building better businesses. And Emanuele has spent kind of a career um, on trying to figure out how to really pioneer new ways to create good organizations. And that's really what we want to hear about more. And again, we will try to do that in a dialogic way, bringing in different perspectives and different roles. And finally, we will kind of close out with a view on leadership and how to really make a difference in your own life. So hopefully that will be again, an interesting discourse for everybody who follows us. And um, let me go straight into the first section, which is a little bit of positioning. So Antoinette and I have um, created a project called Good Organizations, and you can find more details on goodorganizations.com, which is really about holding a dialogue with lots of very insightful people um, to discuss and, and challenge the key questions of our times. And one of the fundamental beliefs we have is that our organizations can become forces for good. They can act in a good way in regards to how they interact with their ecology and ecosystem. They can provide a container for individuals who live in those organizations as a big chunk of their lives to flourish together. And finally, they, become, they can become a positive breeding ground for all the individuals in their own journey towards leading a good life, whatever that means for them individually. And in that context, we want to bring together a whole number of interesting constituencies a number of people who hold um, very interesting or critical perspectives on these questions as free thinkers. We want to engage researchers who have evidence to qualify some of the thoughts that come out of the free thinkers corner, so to speak. And then we want to get advice from people who we believe are wise because they have tried through their own life and their own careers to bridge theory and practice. And Emmanuel, of course, is, is one of those. And then eventually we want to create a narrative which unites all these different constituents and propose it through what we call the Salons for Humanity to a number of business leaders and see if we can together experiment a little bit and maybe, maybe, maybe at the end of this make the world a little bit better for ourselves in the organizations that we lead. And with that, I would say the second aspect of setting the scene, handing over to Antoinette, um, a little bit more about our guest for today, Emanuele. Antoinette, over to you. Yes, I'm very, very happy to have you here, Emanuele. Thank you that you take the time. And I will start more with an American introduction, then come a little bit more into European style. The American introduction is that you have been a successful consultant with big companies for 15 years, and then decided um, that you can spare your time a little bit more um, in a better fashion. Because uh, where your heart seems to be is that you want to build better organizations. And, and you told us, primarily with the large businesses. I would say you want to stop the suffering, but maybe you say that a little bit different. You would probably say you want them to be entrepreneurial, nimble, emergent, complexity proof. So, so I'm just trying to get some of your um, words into that. And of course we can see here um, that you have now started to uh, have a company on the boundaryless organization. So fluidity is another big topic for you. And the article which most brought us was about your revolution towards the human organization. So I'm really looking forward to explore human with you. Thank you so much. Yes, I think you touched upon a number of, uh, of topics just to reinforce uh, a couple. Yes, I share uh, your passion for a role of business that can be more 
than making money, more than maximizing shareholder profit. And I believe that especially today, after the last couple of days, we should rethink what uh, for-profit organization can and should do into, into the world. This is what I've done personally. So not just uh, looking at others, but trying to reflect on myself and leaving the traditional consulting space and trying to walk the talk and uh, run a number of uh, experiments at the inter intersection of organizations, uh, people and, uh, and, uh, and business. And yes, fluidity to me is important also at a personal level because I like security, you know, I like uh, to know. Uh, I'm a computer scientist, so I like algorithms and a bit of, uh, you know, continuity. But still, I push myself uh, beyond the comfort zone, trying to, to live and breathe uh, this hard transition that many people every morning, morning are living. Uh, so trying to find meaning into, into the work and trying to have organizations that are meaningful for the world. So that's why I'm here, I guess, and what I would like to share with you. And, and I just want to say, uh, let's have that for a topic later, fluidity versus stability. It was nice that you brought that up because that's a very, very core question. But Otti, I guess we have some further questions. Um, yeah, as always, I think our, our audience is probably quite curious about the personalities behind the slides, so to speak. So you've already brought in a few of your personal viewpoints into the question. And of course, uh, it's also great to have you here as a friend, Emanuele. And I've seen some of that, what you say, and I, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a great believer that uh, you're, you're onto something. But let me ask you, what are the challenges? I guess this has also not been always easy. So if you want to uh, kind of leading a good life and leading a good work in the way that you describe it, what have you found troublesome? What were the, the, the challenges that you've encountered? Uh, I would say the first challenges are at the personal level. Because um, since we're small, uh, we learn, at least in Italy, uh, where I'm coming from, uh, to, to look for certainty, to look for, you know, a traditional path to, to find a permanent job, possibly well paid with lots of status, lots of benefits. And I see many people struggling with it. And I had it. So I had to intentionally and consciously uh, push myself out from it and uh, it felt weird why are you doing that you are not so young anymore right everybody's looking for this why you are trying to do the opposite but on the other side I, I really see millions of people struggling every day while spending most of their life for companies they don't respect they don't like with colleagues uh, they don't go very well along uh, with and uh, I think this is a, a massive social problem because of the output that we are missing as a society, but also in terms of realization uh, that that we miss as human beings. Uh, and uh, I always felt uh, the call of uh, trying to do um, something about it uh, and struggling to find uh, a perfect or a final solution to this. And probably this is also one of the topics that we have uh, we have in common, trying to take responsibility for this transition, because also at the organizational level, uh, most of it doesn't resonate yet. Most organizations don't feel this is their goal, don't feel they have to take responsibility for it. And even when they, they can understand it, uh, they don't know how to to walk uh, this, this, this journey. So I think it's, uh, it's twofold, uh, creating this sense of urgency, but even more uh, paving uh, the way so that more organizations can really act uh, on, uh, on, uh, on this. And uh, there is no predetermined journey. So that's uh, Let me stop you there, Manuel, because you're already getting into the third topic. I was still with you personally. And what I'm hearing is it comes at a cost going your own way and trying to lead a life at work as will make you flourish wasn't always easy not in not to convince yourself but also i think in the perceptions of people around you as you suggested and i wonder Antoinette, 
I think there's a, there's a recurring topic that we're hearing from people is this desire for autonomy. On the other hand, kind of a, a need to collaborate, also be part of a community and this kind of trying to bring these pieces together. It seems to be something that is, is always an undercurrent. And um, Antoinette, Antoinette, back to you for a maybe final question to Emmanuel about his own way. Well, I'm just kind of um, having Italy also a little bit different in mind because, of course, to Switzerland, northern Italy is a little bit closer, and that's very, very entrepreneurial area. It's, I mean, probably, sorry about the rest of the guys in Europe, most, most entrepreneurial region we have in Europe. And here I was kind of thinking, you probably would also have a lot of um, teachers or examplers who kind of uh, maybe inspired you. So I was uh, really wanting to know, do you have people who inspired you about leading this better life for you then? Not really, because if you grow up uh, in a corporate environment, uh, that's not the model. And you live in a space in which this ambition, uh, I believe, uh, cannot be understood. So my colleagues uh, looked at me with a question mark. And I said, okay, I, I, I want to leave. Why is that? Are you crazy? And you start to believe that you are crazy, maybe, or you're wrong. You are just uh, missing a big opportunity that you won't have uh, anymore in the future. So it's, uh, it's hard to find confirmations into this because the entrepreneurial world is very far from the corporate world uh, I experienced. Uh, and yes, Italy may be uh, intrinsically entrepreneurial, but the, the societal environment uh, doesn't help with that. So if you want to walk into this space, you are accepting uh, to give up everything else in terms of security that, uh, that you want. So in a sense, it uh, looks like a big uh, trade-off, autonomy or security. And I wanted to have both. So my question was, okay, is there a way in which you can have a bit of, uh, of, of both? But recently I've been after, after again, the opportunity to let's say, walk only one path. And I said, no, because I am say, I don't want to go back. I feel this diversity, this richness, the possibility of experiencing different spaces, different people, different topics. Uh, is strategically important uh, in the future that we are entering into. So betting only on, on, on one shape for me is no longer a possible answer in the long term. And this is going to affect uh, millions of people, not just me. I don't think uh, I am unique. I think uh, this is going to, to be important for tens of millions of people in the, in the future. So we need to figure out how to make this transition uh, less uh, frightening probably for people that may not have the conditions to, to, to get started. Or, and I think that will be subject of the second section, create organizations that can embrace that. Because I mean, yeah. looking at my own career coming from a startup into a large organization, I think what I've always tried to do is create an intrapreneurial environment, which would somehow offer, like you say, sufficient autonomy Within not only the stability, but also the opportunities to have impact and scale that a, that a big organization can, of course, offer. Right? So I think there's also this desire for organizations to become much more agile and entrepreneurial and adaptive, which coincides to a degree with what some of the people, at least inside those organizations, want. So the question is, how can we offer those environments? And I think that will, but I know Antoinette will challenge both of us on the notion of entrepreneurial. So is it just entrepreneurial and is that right for everybody? But we will come to that, I think, even in the first section. So let me, on that notion, let me briefly again for our listeners position the inquiry that we are on, briefly moving just to a summary um, page here. So what we are trying to do within this good organizations um, project, but also in the dialogue that will ensue, is to look at um, good organizations or, or um, a good society from different angles. One is from the individual angle, especially through the leadership lens. Then indeed, as organizations, through these different ways that organizations can, impl can impact the, the well-being of the people within and the society. 
And then again, from a society at large perspective, so what does the economy mean in regards to society? And what does good actually mean in the context of a wider kind of dialogue across um, cultures? And in the way that we will structure the following 45 minutes or so is to touch on these three topics in sequence and starting with the big picture. I think we've seen from complexity theory that we cannot resolve parts of the puzzle unless we have some sort of view as to how it all hangs together. So we will, we will dive a little bit into the first section, which is what is actually good? What makes an organization good? And what is Emanuele's perspective on that? Is it normative? Is it contextual? Is it fluid? What is it? And then we will, on that basis, we will go and see, okay, how do we install that in organization? So I will hand back and um, take this slide back and hand back to Antoinette to kick, off or kick us off into the first section. So what, what is a kind of, um, what makes business good? Let's put it that easily. Yeah, and that's almost a question. What <laughs> makes a human-centric organization, in your opinion, good? And I think I already would like to challenge you a bit on that and would also ask you, and how would you measure that? And I would like to challenge you guys uh, uh, about good. I'm really troubled by th this term because it seems like, uh, you know, a Manichaean uh, distinction. So something is good, something is bad. Um, and I struggle with that uh, since I don't believe uh, there is a clear, unique, universal definition of, uh, of good, something that could be good in some mindset and some paradigm may, may look as terrible in, uh, in another one. Um, so I'm always afraid of uh, imposing, let's say, judgment uh, on, uh, on people, even more on organizations based on what could be good uh, for me or for, or for somebody. Um, what I care about uh, is uh, looking at organizations in which... Uh, the human component, but also the humane outcomes are important. And uh, I've seen hundreds and hundreds of organizations saying that, you know, human resources, and already this word, you know, is studying, uh, were key. And then looking at processes and looking at behaviors and discovering exactly, exactly the opposite. I think that after many years, uh, uh, both individuals uh, within the organization and beyond the organization start to care about uh, the reality of human centricity. So I'm picking an organization as a customer or I'm picking an organization as an employee, not because of uh, what is written on the brochure or on the website, but because of the stories of the people that live and interact with that, uh, with that organization. Well, this is becoming important and it's becoming important because uh, on top of having a good salary, some, some of us, maybe many of us, uh, uh, have the ambition to, to find meaning in an organization. And most organizations I see... I, we will make this a little bit interactive, but I think, so, so you're saying you don't want to make distinctions between good and bad. What, what I'm sensing is, you actually have quite a clear perspective on what you want and what you don't want. So maybe yes. if, we, if we don't call it good, can you describe what- Maybe we can even drill down a little bit. You said human resources is kind of bad, but human-centric yeah. is yeah, good. So that's the but terms. I don't understand what the human-centric then means. Yeah. yeah, give us some principles or some words or some concepts mm. that Kind of resonate with that idea that you have in mind as to what you're aiming for even if you don't want to qualify it as good or bad uh, i think the if you want the criterion for me is the 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 value and especially the the recipients of the value that the organization co-creates so traditionally the recipients uh, uh, those benefiting from uh, from the action of the organization it's a very small group, a uh, group with strong interests in the organization, the owners, uh, you know, the shareholders, uh, ignoring all the others. The others are just a means uh, towards the end of giving the small group value. I think that I, I want to say good, but uh, what I appreciate today is definitely going beyond that. So enlarging the, the amount of, uh, of uh, uh, stakeholders up to reaching the world. So 
putting the, all the stakeholders, uh, even your competitors, even the institutions, even customers, even partners, even nature at the same level and, uh, and making decisions uh, uh, based on keeping those other non-traditional stakeholders uh, in mind. And that may look bad for the business because you are not optimizing the usual KPIs uh, uh, in uh, MBOs uh, that managers have. Maybe you are making decisions that are reducing uh, profits uh, or uh, reducing uh, the number of customers, but still that uh, care about the world in the long term. Um, if you apply this holistically, that's what I would define as an organization that uh, is trying to do something good uh, for, for, for the world. But you don't mean only, just to be on the, that I understood correctly, um, you were saying there, we have to kind of have more recipients of the value. So I could also hear like, we just have to share the pie differently, but I think that's not what you meant exclusively. It also has something to do with what you are, what, what value is in, in, for everybody. Is that yeah. correct? Yeah, it is. Uh, we define, we may define value exactly as just, uh, you know, financial streams, but that's, uh, it's important at the end, uh, but it's just one measure. Uh, or we can think about many different capitals, uh, intellectual capital, natural capital, you know, even a psychological capital, what, how, uh, how do we make people feel when interacting with us, with our products, our, our services? Um, so yes, both the, the meaning of value is changing, uh, the recipients of, uh, of that value uh, are ch changing, but also the means of generating that value uh, are changing. Uh, as an example, <clears throat> for for lots of time, uh, we have seen customers as passive recipients. I do the product, uh, I define the strategy, and you buy it. So your only option is to put your money on it or not. And even after uh, having done that, uh, I will ignore you if you have a problem or a feedback. That's you know traditional approach. I, I think we already went beyond that. Uh, so we learned to listen more, but that's not enough. What I'm talking about is to engage the different uh, stakeholders even those that cannot speak such as nature or you know animals uh, in this conversation and with that i mean co-creating the value and even defining the means to go create the value mm -hmm. if you do that uh, sorry, the, the, the output changes sorry i'm uh, being interrupted but Antoinette, I think what Emanuele, beyond the language, is actually describing is what we would call the common good. And I think, again, I think there might be language in the way. But I think, Emanuele, when I look at your human map, and also when I look at some of the design principles that you, for example, use from sociocracy and other techniques, and we will come to that in a second, I think beyond the common good, you also put some let's get principles or, or, or requirements onto the inner workings of the organization, right? So you would probably say um, positional power is not a good idea. And again, good not meaning in a judgmental way, whereas there's some other things that you would aim for, like equivalence or so. Could you, yeah. could you I mean, I'm not making, this, making a list, but what are kind of the, the, in even looking at your own boundaryless company, yeah. What I like to keep print core principles you're trying to embed. So the, this idea of distributing power as power to me is an intrinsically uh, property of the system. So you cannot get rid of power. Power is there. So you can only be intentional in how you distribute and use power. So distributing power intentionally is already a way to uh, to nudge, to nurture the engagement uh, of multiple stakeholders. Um, so this is a first principle. Uh, it's not me, the boss, the CEO, the board, the manager, it's everybody. This is very democratic, uh, a, bit, uh, a bit scaring, uh, both for those that have power and those that today don't have power. Uh, but to me, is a key measure for good business, not just for the good impact, uh, 
because it means having uh, individuals, uh, teams as sensors of reality. And so having the organization as adaptive system um, in comparison to reality. And that's what we need right now today because the world is changing so fast in a way that is uncertain. So that, that's, that's, one, that's one point. Um, the other point uh, is, uh, or another point is transparency. We have, uh, as people in power, we have been benefiting from lack of transparency. Uh, asymmetry of information is power. What I know that you don't know is a way for me to get more value, to squeeze value out from the system. So transparency is, uh, is definitely another, uh, another um, value. And, uh, and the, probably the other point is uh, equivalence. So believing that uh, regardless of the hierarchical position or the status or uh, how much money you make a year, people are equivalent. And all of them deserve a space. And all of them <clears throat> deserve support from the organization to participate. That's, uh, that's uh, key. <clears throat> and it connects a lot with the culture of the organization, the values of the organization, <clears throat> even what the organization stands for. And usually we are not intentional about that. So maybe we don't believe people are equivalent. Even if we do, we don't hold, we don't protect uh, this, this space for people to grow in the organization. That's another point. So seeing the, the organization as a vehicle for growth, individual growth, societal growth and the growth of, of teams. So I believe the organization is really an accelerator for some outcomes, not an end in, in itself, not an end for some people, but a vehicle for making the world a better place. I used to say what I do is uh, trying to help organization become better, to build a better, better world. Um, so looking at the organization to look uh, to look at the world. So having the organization interacting with the world, not just in terms of extraction of value, but in terms of co-creation of value. For me, um, this is a yeah. You can call it a common common good, but it's also a good business. It's not just uh, you know uh, being good about the world. It's being good about yourself and the world. But I think it perfectly resonates, I think, Antoinette, with our thinking, right? But I, can I ask one more, and then back to Antoinette, um, challenging question that came up already, individual versus collective. So in, in this equation almost to say, we want the individual to flourish, we want the collective to flourish, and through their activities, we want the ecosystem to flourish, right? So all these levels connect like you just described it. So do you also see limitations to autonomy? Is there something where you sense there have to be norms of what people owe to each other inside that system? Or are you saying um, almost unbundle as much as possible? And Michele Zanini said yesterday, make power infinite inside the system by creating as many small cells as possible. So you don't even have that problem of distributing it. What, 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 how, where do you stand there? I think that in any in any system there are there are many levels, and uh, it's not so difficult to focus on a single level. At the end, it's quite easy, uh, whether that's the individual, the team, or the department, the, the unit. Uh, um, what what is a bit more complex is looking at the interdependence among the 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 levels. And for at least 100 years, we have been uh, addressing this challenge uh, through structure. So we define the rules, the, we distributed work and tasks, uh, and we monitored that we gave incentives for people to behave in a way that we envision statically. It's possible, again, it's uh, very um, prevalent today, but this brings a number of problems. In terms of exactly in terms of autonomy, in terms of ambition, in terms of creativity, in terms of motivation, in terms of impact uh, and realization of the individuals. So I think that uh, the autonomy of the individual doesn't go against uh, having a system because otherwise we wouldn't be talking about an organization. I think the, the, what we tend to say in Wanderlust is that uh, the future is not about organizations. It's about uh, organizing. 
So it's about finding those founding principles, uh, the enabling constraints, uh, the minimum viable structure that uh, maintains a messy coherence, uh, to tell it with Sonia uh, Bligno, um, for the system to remain a system while leaving uh, the broadest space possible to the individuals and teams within those constraints. And the constraints could be the purpose, uh, it could be the rights that uh, the, the levels of the system will, will, will have, and different constraints will generate, of course, different outcomes. But uh, I believe we need to stay, to keep ourselves far from statically imposing the position of every individual into the space and only establishing the minimum amount of, uh, of principles to facilitate flow. It's a totally so different no, perspective. So the individual is coordinated via transactional mechanisms wherever that is needed, but there's no common set of norms beyond a common purpose. So I'm, I'm not solidaristic, so to speak, with somebody. There's no uh, constraint mm -hmm. of my autonomy and freedom as such in this it's a, it's not it's not that i don't want to use the word rule or constraint in terms of uh, this is what you must be this is what you must do uh, i see them more as attractors so at the end it's uh, nudges that uh, you put in the system to achieve something and this is arbitrary so it's my company i would like to see something uh, thanks to this company but it's not telling people what to do, it's giving them a nudge, so giving them uh, an incentive in the broadest term, not monetary incentive, for the right individuals to be attracted and to do their own thing into, into this organizational space. So it's not rules, uh, it's, it's not norms. Uh, I don't believe it, it's normative, uh, it's a nudge into the system. So as an individual into the system, I could do the opposite of what the system does, but probably that wouldn't be so exciting or efficient. So eventually I may leave the system, not because I've, I'm going against a rule that pushed me out, but because it's not effective for me to live into the system. This happened to me personally. I could have stayed there forever, but I felt that I was spending lots of my time and energy in a way that wasn't efficient. And uh, so I pushed myself out uh, um believing that i could find other places more resonating with what i wanted to achieve so i think this is the difference not the rule but let's say the the, the nudge uh, that will attract will motivate and will facilitate some kind of output from uh, from uh, the people and and the last point is that uh, this is not deterministic there is no way even if you want to set rules and not uh, and not principles uh, in which uh, you can anticipate the exact results uh, of the rules that you have written. Because the system uh, will generate uh, unpredictable emergent outcomes uh, that you cannot fully anticipate. So we have to be very careful in terms of this. I mean, that's, I think we are going to deep dive a little bit later into that as well, or again. I'm not sure that I would completely follow you on um, cultural norms being the same almost like rules and it wouldn't be in here that they have cultural norms because yesterday we kind of heard a little bit of a different story as well um, and also I believe there might be some things which are already contradicting and which is just interesting to see for instance how does competition and co-creation which you find so important um, beyond the micro enterprise go together. So that's something maybe we can tease out later a little bit more. But I mean, we have one last thing on this good society or um, ethical business aspect, um, which you already started to discuss about, and which I'm really curious. You say, um, well, uh, you don't believe in universality, and we shouldn't try to be universal. And I mean, there, there are like two things to me. First of all, I believe that there are some universal ideas behind what you're saying. So I, I do believe that um, for you, suffering would be to be kind of suffocated by rules, for instance, not having autonomy to grow. So that sounds to me pretty much like a universal value. And the other thing, um, yesterday we learned from Alicia about um, DAO. And DAO, I have learned, is the very strong underlying 
same philosophy and here I found it very interesting. They have they have universal values. Um, modesty is one, for instance. Not not competing with others, at least in the writings, that's a very important one. Do not attach yourself to um, material things. And again, um, I would even um, say some of these things are universal, not, not only Tao. And I just kind of want to tease out whether um, you see no universal um, good goods in the world. But, but why should this be universal? Even, even my preferences, why should them be universal? Those are mine. Those could be those of the company. Fine even a big company, even a model resonating with the market, but it doesn't mean that everybody should agree with that. And let's uh, look at competition. Uh, I mean, I think... Uh, one, I wouldn't... Uh, I think that's not a value, but I mean, why wouldn't suffering be... Do you think there's anybody in the world who wants to... Um, I think that uh, suffering could be the consequence of some, uh, some other principles or some behavior. So somebody would say suffering is needed. To achieve something bigger would i agree with that maybe not but it's me so thinking that this should be the universal rule well i don't think i don't think that what i prefer uh, is universal i think that it's my preference it's uh, even a feeder for me uh, in terms of kind of organizations i would like to see i would like to to work for or work with uh, but still i don't believe it's the word is so simple to that can be um, described with the five, you know, norms or five universal uh, values or, or 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 rules. So that's. Um, but Emanuele, would you agree? I want to... go ahead, please. Yeah, please go ahead. Sorry, there's some Wi-Fi troubles. I apologize um, to everybody listening. Um, Emanuele, would you agree though, and I'm thinking especially about our discussion about virtue ethics, where the ultimate discriminator is um, the telos, so the, the final objective is the good life. And I think that means everybody flourishes, not more than that. And then actually every principle gets put into relation to that in the context that it applies to say, okay, let's test all the potential principles we could use against ultimately we would want a system that like you described it earlier contributes to the flourishing of the system is that something that you would in your mind endorse which is contextual yet ultimately should contribute to something like you said earlier to the the, the ecosystem the nature all the different stakeholders is, is that where you would agree yeah but does it mean that uh, if we want the system to flourish so if we have good intentions then every part of the system will flourish. I don't think so. So I think that uh, having good intentions uh, is too generic. So yes, I can agree with that. But um, you may generate monsters uh, by having good intentions. So that, mean, that means to me that uh, you have to be locally relevant. You cannot just have uh, universal principles uh, ignoring uh, the local implications. So maybe you have flourishing on one side of the company or the society, and you have really a poor situation in another one. Um, so is this principle really solving uh, the problem? I don't, don't think so. I think we need something more specific. And um, it's also is the mechanism for people trying to locally optimize what they see, what they want to have, what they, what they generate. Um, and for which I don't believe uh, having uh, just telos is enough. Okay, we can agree with that, but, but what does it mean? What does it mean? For the people locally to find out by appropriate okay. connection and judgment, right? So they would use that to discriminate potential principles, designs, and, and causes of action to prevent suffering or enable flourishing. Yeah, yeah, but I would say to enable my flourishing, I will destroy your or prevent your flourishing. Um, is that fine? Uh, what can we do about it? Uh, that's why I was talking about enabling constant 
constraints. Naming constraints are vague in a sense, mm -hmm. constraint a bit, uh, but not too much as to they are not governing constraints, meaning that they are, they are not uh, closing the space, they are opening the space. They are what we have in common, uh, what really motivates all of us more than telling us what we cannot do or shouldn't uh, do. So, you know, it's uh, an, uh, a perspective meant uh, to, to nurture more than a perspective meant to restrict what, uh, what but, but should if, happen. If what motivates us is destroying the Amazon to create more corn fields or whatever fields that people are creating in the Amazons, that might still not qualify as being what you want, right? No. I mean, otherwise, building the perfect no. war machine would be a good company. No, not what I want, uh, but uh, can we prevent it? Well, if we all take accountability for the whole, then yes. But we are not. That's, that's, so the, 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 the word situation, I think it's very telling. We don't agree on what we want, or we may have reasons for not agreeing. And, and that's the reality. So the question is, what can we do about it? Can we... Uh, use a normative approach and would that uh, convince people to adhere to the approach? I don't believe that. I could aspire to that. I could like that personally, but I, I don't believe this is effective. That's, uh, that's, um, th th that's my point. So idealistically, yes, forever. What's the alternative, Emmanuel? What's the alternative? So what in your way of creating a good organization would ensure that people are not becoming monsters using your yeah. term. So I think uh, the, the, the approach that Ayer, the Brennan he is using, uh, is telling, not, not because of uh, the specific implementation. The specific implementation is interesting, but the principles to me are more interesting. Basically, you have two problems that appear to be uh, one against the other. The first one is how can you unleash freedom? Mm -hmm. And many of us would agree with that. We want to have organizations that really leave us more space, more creativity, more, more impact, more flourishing. But that's the easy part. There are many examples in the world, uh, uh, from Bjurzorg uh, to Morningstar, uh, even the agile world at the end is meant uh, to leave space self-management uh, to individuals. But that's the easy part. What we also want to do is to nudge uh, collaboration among companies, among individuals, among teams. And uh, we want to do both of them at scale. That's the third uh, ambition, not uh, with three people, not with 300 people, but with 300,000 people, with three millions of people. A and the, the answer is messiness. So if we really aspire to have a neat, clean situation, which like uh, a magnetic field, every particle will align, well, we are in the world of, uh, you know, idealism. Uh, we have to accept redundancy. We have to accept imperfection. That's what IR does. What IR does is uh, let's decide uh, the basic uh, mechanisms, the, the basic attractors, the enabling constraints, <clears throat> as less as possible. And there are some, of course. So if you don't accept them, you're out. You are not part of that organization. It's a bit more difficult to, for the world, but still uh, looking at the organization. But you have to accept uh, uh, the lack of uh, clarity. You have to accept uh, competition. You have to accept in, in perception, in perce imperfection into that. So you may have teams that are doing the same thing and competing in the same company. It's perfectly fine. But you may also have the same team collaborating in some cases, and you are nudging both of those, of those behaviors. I don't believe that uh, there is any contradiction into that. We want to have freedom, but we also want to have convergence uh, and, uh, and collaboration. And also in terms of strategy, that's a typical you know, question that companies have. Strategy is the work of the big guys calling the shots, sitting in a nice table and say, okay, next year we're going to do 10 billions by doing this, this, and this. What they do is different. They believe there are some interesting areas. They call them industry platforms, but there are areas. And instead of telling parts of the companies to work in those areas, now you are part of the uh, internet of home, they nudge people they attract people to do this. So I'm putting money on the table, investments. If you want, you can take that money 
and still do whatever you want with that money in that space, but you could do something else entirely. So I'm not telling you what to do. I'm nudging the system in some specific situations that I, uh, I prefer, leaving plenty of freedom to work together, even with people that are not part of the company. So the company is porous. You have startups, you have competitors. So is this a company? Well, is this me, really me, what we believe in? question, Emanuele, because we're going into the organizational development because I'm still not clear. What you're describing now is what you, I think, feel is a liberated way of organizing. I'm still not sure why applying that logic, they couldn't destroy the Amazon by your own, by your own judgment. It could, it, like it could, it could. That, that's what I'm, I'm saying. Can we really avoid it as a species? So I think what you're focusing on is let's make sure that the organizing works and then we need to figure out how to crack the nut, the, the nut of getting to that good outcome that we described in a common good or whatever you want to call it fashion. But let me, let me crunch up the first section so we can move into the second because I think maybe it's worthwhile explaining Rendon Hayi or a highest model a little bit further before taking it apart. But Antoinette, shall we, is there another question you wanted in the first block or shall we wrap it up? I, I would suggest to wrap it up and I found it very valuable to hear, hear somebody and you're not the only one, definitely, um, saying, well, universal morals, that's um, nothing I can kind of see in my worldview. But uh, so, so, sorry, let me specify this. It doesn't mean <laughs> I don't value it. Mm -hmm. no, it no. means that I don't believe this is the solution. Yeah. Uh, so it, it leaves us with a problem or at least a space yeah. for 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 action so i think we must pursue this yeah i don't think uh, aspiring to a universal common view is the answer to solve the problems of of the of the world okay because i just wanted to point that out and in a nutshell for me what came out very strongly is that you say well we have to think differently about value and there we are more we haven't we have not yet the solution, but the aspiration. So the aspiration is value needs to be co-created with various stakeholders, even with the silent one, with nature. Kind of linking this a little back to, bit back to our Amazon uh, discussion. Then it also needs to be shared differently. It's not fairly shared at present. Plus, it's also we also have to think uh, about the means how we create that value. And that's a rather holistic and broad view what mm -hmm. makes good businesses. That's what I'm taking with me. And I would, I would build on that and maybe Emanuele, you close us out for the kind of what is a good organization part. What I took with me on top was you are thinking a lot about power. And, and I think you're very clear that the accumulation of power in the hands of a few contradicts this whole notion of getting to what Antoinette described there as a good value outcome. And I think one of the things that, that I took note of, and of course I knew in advance, was this notion of transparency and asymmetry of power. Whatever configuration we end up with, we'll need to have much more shared power. And it resonates also with uh, Mari Parker Follett's idea of power with rather than power over and, and so on. Um, and then I think you're very strongly going into the organizing as opposed to the organization as a vehicle and almost the journey becomes the destination of, of getting people into a position where they can um, flourish through more autonomy, through bringing things to life, and they can be redundant. It's a naturally evolving, I, like, I love this term, messy coherence, that you're bringing into a minimum viable structure that is needed basically to hold this evolving living organization. And I think what you're saying is, however, Putting that type of organization in place would not necessarily fix, like you just su suggested, the problem of that organization going into the wrong direction. What I heard you, there might need to be some nudges, either in terms of enabling conditions or attractors, or even just the founders' intentions that are pervasive somehow in that system that lead people to moving into the right direction, whatever that means in that context, and, 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 and nurturing that common good. And if not, there will be some potentially some sanction by people either self-selecting themselves out because they don't endorse that system, or there might be an intervention of some kind to ensure that it's not going into wrong. So this is kind of how I would crunch up for me the first part. Anything you want to add to that, Emmanuel? 
Yeah, the only thing that I will add is that some of our organizations have massive impact. Think about uh, the, the weight of Facebook in political elections in the United States. So some kind of behavior, even some kind of algorithm that could seem uh, inoffensive, could be very offensive and could have massive uh, implications for the world. So even one organization taking a different path intentionally, so implementing some rules, some mechanisms, uh, could uh, really change history, make history. So while I think that uh, a universal normative perspective is not uh, the solution, I think that true organizations, through some organizations that have reached uh, exponential scale and growth, uh, we may nudge the system uh, in some uh, in some direction what i'm just saying is that uh, it's a, a cultural process more than a normative process so it's really about uh, negotiating paradigms uh, decisions uh, readiness actions uh, between people that uh, probably want something different uh, explicitly or not so it's it's complex it's not complicated uh, but definitely even a single event uh, may have uh, massive repercussions. So we have to be careful and also we should have hope because even a single individual may have a huge impact. And I think it's, it's, it's super interesting. And I think, Antoinette, this is really at the very core of this inquiry to say it's not deterministic. However, the way it's currently emerging is clearly not fully right because there's so much suffering. So what is the intervention in the system in a way that makes sense, that could help? And again, I think, and let's go to the organizational section now, which is how, how do we build organizations that provide that hope by becoming good actors, so to speak, or at least not making the system worse. Um, whereas I, I, it resonates again, the conversation about meritocracy with Michele Zanini yesterday, where we kind of ended on the, on the idea that the method of meritocracy in itself is not the problem. The problem is embedding it in a mindset that is materialistic, individualistic against each other. And I think, Antoinette, yesterday, even in the discussion about Rendon Hayi with the Alicia, there was the notion that actually this, this, this principle of be like water, not only be nimble, but also be humble and, and kind of be of service was something that was very strong behind these practices, which maybe if you just take the practices could make people believe they could have shadows and, and negative consequences, but there's some underlying philosophy which is very strong. And maybe Emanuele serves as that attractor or, or, or enabling constraint for the system. But before we go there, let me bring up a slide because I think Whenever um, we talk about Rendon Hayi and Haya, it's, it's actually not so easy. Um, so let me go and bring up one slide here. But before we go into maybe exploring this briefly, Emanuele, can I take a step back? Because you are trained in, I think, every organizational development methodology that's out there. So what I would like you for also the listeners, but also Antoinette and myself, firstly, to maybe take a step back and, and qualify what you perceive to be the prevailing, most interesting organizational development methodologies. And I have like holacracy, sociocracy, maybe Teal, if you, if you consider that standalone, Rand and Hayi, the old bureaucracies. What are the key dimensions that you use to qualify these different one different uh, types and how do they differ in your mind can you just take us on a, on a quick ride across these from your own perspective set the scene and then we will go briefly into rent and high and what makes it special yes with pleasure uh, the, the the first topic that i would raise is that uh, in the last few years last five ten years we have been a, we have been seeing a cambrian explosion of models of new models, really new models. So even if uh, scholars are not so sure about that, I'm sure, I think we are seeing new models. We are seeing uh, new ideas, but we are seeing many of them and uh, all of them seems to bring something new. While at the end, all of them insist uh, on a few dimensions. It could be 10, 15, it doesn't matter, but there are only a few dimensions. So instead of focusing on the model, 
even higher doesn't talk about any model, um, we should think about the need. So what we want to achieve as a company, the outcome, who we are, our culture, our trajectory. So a few years ago, I built this human organization map to try to look at the many success stories, at the many models and, uh, and define uh, the dimensions. And I think there are different levels of dimensions. There is a, a level, there is a, the organization itself. There is a level, there is the team. There is a level, there is the individual. And there is a level also, there is the physical, physical space. And uh, just to pick some of the areas into, this, uh, into these levels, I think that we are touching on new ways to define uh, the, the purpose of the organization. So what the organization is trying to do and stands for in the world, it's, uh, it's a matter of how the organization creates value. We have been talking about that uh, uh, before. Uh, it, it's a matter of uh, how you can, uh, you can coordinate people into, into the firm. We usually have managers, but we are seeing new firms. Uh, it's a matter of the visibility of the information. So we have been talking about uh, uh, transparency. Uh, it's a matter of power, how you distribute power, how you make uh, decisions of, of authority, because power at the end is possibility and it's motivation. It's about uh, the, the freedom that people have uh, and the way they are treated. Uh, so if the way is fair, or, or not, uh, if they can take ownership about it. So at the end, we have many, many levels and no model, no case is addressing all of them. That brings uh, lots of responsibility for individual organizations because they have to be careful and intentional on where to spend their time, their money in terms of the outcomes they want to achieve. So again, the starting point is what you want to achieve, not the example, not the model. and uh, Personally, what I'm trying to do is to mixing ideas from different models. I don't believe, again, there is one solution and I don't believe that uh, the, the models, the examples are acting uh, at the same level. So to be concrete and then to go into the details maybe of the RENNE, the RENNE is addressing some levels, the level of, uh, you know, uh, if you want uh, understanding how to create teams, uh, how to aggregate teams, uh, it's not telling much of what is happening within a team. It's not telling much even with the cultural elements about, uh, to me, about the purpose of the organization. CEO Jean Grumini would say the opposite. Uh, he believes that there is a strong purpose of uh, unlocking human potential, but then it is there, but probably it's not the uh, strongest aspect that is perceived uh, in, in the field. So I think, uh, being intentional about what you want to achieve and finding the right pieces and then finding uh, the right recipe, building the right re recipe from the ingredients is the responsibility of uh, the individual organization. But for the purpose of, of the listeners, and also I think to tease out a little bit of your long experience being, being trained and qualified in all these methodologies, can I just be a little bit facetious and just kind of get like a, a one sentence from you and all the models before we go yeah. to Rendon Hayi. Let me just lead you through this because I think you started with holacracy really and you're trained and you talk to Brian yeah. Robertson and so on. So kind of the good and bad of holacracy in a word and maybe something that you learned from the application within uh, Tony Shea's uh, Zappos. Uh, what, what's, your, what's your nutshell statement on it? Well, let's start from the good maybe uh, and when we talk about organizations, uh, we, we really believe that uh, the issues are with the bad manager or uh, the, uh, the, the bad uh, lack that we have in a specific case. What Alagrosi believes is that uh, the, the, the problem is the system. And it's uh, meant as an operating system for organizations. And the language is already telling about the mindset behind, behind it. So what it provides is really a, a set of uh, algorithms for people to be more efficient, more intentional at uh, distributing value and working together. This is very good. It's what most organizations miss, but uh, 
it also comes with this idea that uh, our most human aspects so we, maybe we are not perfect we are not organized we are not always linear and punctual are the problem so it tries to extract these traits from the organization design it's really an operating system but the thing is that we are not uh, computers we are human beings and this also has value and to me this is also the bit of the the the, the limit it's uh, a bit too cold for me um powerful but a bit uh, a bit too cold it doesn't mean that you could counterbalance this but let's say this is the you know tendency of 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 the approach sociocracy from which allocracy has been largely taken i would say 90 percent of it has come from sociocracy comes with a totally different mindset with the belief that organizations are living things so yes imperfect but we want to see this this imperfection we want to see human beings just to give you an example um the circle there is the basic unit in both the allocracy and sociocracy in one case allocracy is a cell of the system in the other case sociocracy is a group of people so the, the the human trait is so is so important and that's what attracted me to sociocracy this uh, this feeling of uh, a community of a group of caring about each other's in the language, even with the same organizational tools. This is uh, to me fascinating. It's Absolutely. the same tool, totally different uh, flavors. And I think building on that, Emanuele, I think what is really curious for Antoinette and I is, I mean, sociocracy came from Quaker families, right? So there's a very strong religious, so to speak, or at least let's call it community connotation. And when you, when you speak to James Priest and Ted Rao and so on about artful participation and some of their beliefs in terms of the underlying philosophy, and they quote some kind of, a, I've forgotten what it's called, the, the, the not Cuban, but some, some South, South American rebel groups and so on, and, mm -hmm. and, and the, the decentralization of power. So there's a very strong ideology Yes. that is uh, transcendental and and really believing in the, the community and and the common good the contribution to something important wouldn't you agree there's a there's, there is a philosophy yes. that is very strong yeah and again this could be good or bad for me it's good but uh, it may not resonate with some context and that's why to be sincere sociocracy struggled a lot in the business space because the language probably doesn't resonate with uh, uh, with managers and with profits uh, and with gains and all of that. Instead, I believe that uh, introducing this flavor into a business environment really balances the, 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 the environment. And that's what exactly I'm doing. So I'm working with corporations uh, in uh, seeing uh, these humane traits uh, as an asset, not uh, uh, as a liability, I would, uh, I, would, uh, I would say. So yes, it's coming with a strong connotation. It's important to be aware of this connotation yeah. because it may not work or because it may be the differentiator in, in, in your space. And I will hand over to Antoinette in a second because I'm sure she will want to dive into this community versus autonomy aspect a little bit further. But maybe just in a, in a quick uh, sentence from you, I'll throw the others at you. So what's your view on Teal in a, in a nutshell and Agile? What, what comments would you have on those? Hmm. Okay, I'll try to be as gentle as possible. Um, I, I think they have merit in the sense that uh, if we want to have an impact on, on the world, uh, the more we have conversations uh, about ways of organizing in which human beings uh, and all those stakeholders are more central, they're good. So both Teal and, uh, and Agile, different ways uh, do this. Um, Teal comes from, uh, from a book uh, reinventing organizations from Frederick Laloux that has been uh, amazingly successful. Many managers that have no interest in organizational design read the book. That's good. So we learned about stories, we learned about other ways of designing your organization. Is this structured enough? Is this concrete enough? Is this robust enough? Is this uh, researched enough? I don't believe so. So it's, uh, it's a way to open the door uh, for an exploration which organizations should take responsibility. Uh, 
Agile, again, has been massively successful. Um, and uh, very often, even this morning, I got the question is, so are we talking about Agile? Why well, Agile is taking care of one piece of this big, big picture. And that's why I'm using this human orientation map, because you could see what is in and what is out. So if you have a team, uh, you want to use rituals to facilitate uh, how the team works, and maybe you want to infuse a different mindset through this, well, okay, fine, the agile. Is agile revamping uh, the way of organizing? Uh, I don't believe so. It wasn't even the goal of, of agile. So the problem is not with agile or with teal, it's with the lack of awareness about what they can do and what they cannot do. Unfortunately, this is the state of the market. Most organizations uh, don't bother uh, going this deep and just use what uh, some consulting company sold them. So very interesting. What I'm seeing is a need for, and I think, I mean, I hope that we're okay with the time boundaries because I realize our conversation has, has almost anticipated already taken us further and beyond what we expected, but it's so interesting. And I'm, I'm very grateful, Emanuele, that you are taking the time. What I'm hearing here very clearly is it has to be intentional and it has to be holistic. Looking just at one piece might kind of create issues that you're not aware of. And before you know it, you're just reendorsing the existing model without actually solving the challenges. Yeah? Super interesting. So maybe, Emmanuel, if you're happy to just, in a nutshell, because there's a lot of complexity behind it, but maybe just describe this picture, then I will take it off again, yeah. and then I will give the microphone back, so to speak, to Antoinette to maybe explore a little bit further on the good organization. Then we go to leaders, and then we're on our way out. I'll try to be very brief. What you see here uh, is a uh, depiction and uh, abstraction of the Brennan AE model. Uh, what the Brennan AE is, uh, um, is a way to close the gap, to reduce the distance between every employee and every customer. And uh, so the first uh, customer centricity, if we want, is the same and the first uh, principle, but the other principle is really unlocking the human potential. So we want uh, to set uh, human beings free into an organization. So going back to your comment, Otti, before, it's really thinking that every employee could be an entrepreneur, not only an intrapreneur, an entrepreneur, meaning the owner, partly owner of an entity, eventually. And it does that by taking inspiration from the market. So it's bringing ideas that we see often in the market, such as ecosystem and platforms within the organization, because we learned in the last 40 years that the only way to act as an ecosystem or as a platform in the market is to be an ecosystem and a platform within the organization. So at the end, this is not a choice. If you want to play that game, you have to do that both externally and internally. Maybe this is not your strategy. It's becoming bigger and bigger, but it may be not your strategy. So maybe the Renan is not the best model for you. Just think about that. But if you want to uh, play this role, there are only a few concepts. The first concept is the micro enterprise. Instead of having 80,000 or 90,000 90, people in a monolith, you have uh, 4,000 small teams called micro enterprises. It's really a small company. A company that can decide the strategy, can decide the people that sh should work there, can decide how to distribute money. So it's really a small company with a distinct profit and loss, plenty of freedom. The second concept is the enterprise micro community. So it's, uh, it's, uh, it's really about uh, how to reconnect uh, those many small teams uh, into value for the user what I call the user scenario, because they believe that the goal is not selling a product. The goal is becoming an ecosystem brand, They're really trying to serve uh, the user along, along his or her life. And that's necessarily about orchestrating multiple players that are not even in hire. It could be your competitors, it could be your startup. As boundaryless, we are into an EMC with people from, from hire. The third concept is uh, unbundling also the core of the bureaucracy in the duration organization, HR, IT, finance, legal, support functions. 
Those functions become small teams themselves, small teams that are measured against the needs of their colleagues, so their internal fights. These are called shared service platforms, but there, are, uh, there is another type of platform, there is the industry platforms. The industry platforms uh, are with one bundle strategy. Again, instead of telling uh, this is the strategy, this is what you have to do, what they say is, I want to nudge the system in some specific directions and people can uh, jump on board with their, their own small teams, migrant enterprise, take the money and then create something new. Uh, this is in a nutshell, the, the model, if, if we have to summarize it, it's, it has three properties. It's entrepreneurial, so we want every individual to potentially become an owner, or at least uh, to sense opportunities in the market and act on opportunities in the market. It's ecosystemic, uh, intentionally we want to distribute uh, value and collaboration among uh, the different entities. And it's enabling, meaning that uh, it tries to crystallize some standard common services and to, and to uh, offer these services efficiently to the entire firm without uh, maintaining the bureaucracy that we see today in the organization. This is working massively. They built it across uh, more than 35 years. Uh, I, thanks to this, became uh, the leader of White Good Appliances, and especially this model now is studied and, uh, and uh, taken for inspiration in many uh, Fortune 500 organizations in the world. Very interesting. Even McKinsey is starting to write about it, thanks to also what you it seems so. and Bill Fisher are, are I think, uh, doing. And also Dana Zoha, who hopefully we will have uh, soon to talk to us as well about it, I think has been long engaged with, um, with that model. So, I will stop sharing this and hand over to Antoinette, as I'm sure you will have a few follow-up questions. Yeah, I would actually like to drill down, and we can take Heyer as an example, because you nicely said that there are different systems for different contexts. So I hear that you are not kind of saying that's the only one. That's already something very important. But what I find very interesting about Heyer, among other things, is that they have infused and you were even saying entrepreneurs, so you can also share the profit. So they have a lot of the external market dynamics in form of competition now inside the company. And um, there we, of course, have a polarity with collaboration. And you were always saying, well, there are ways to kind of navigate that. But before I will ask you how they navigate that, I just give you some little findings. I mean, we know that on average, competition between groups, which are in your case, your micro enterprises, create the us versus stem um, dynamic, making co-creation above already a little bit difficult. We also know if you would have that principle even within the micro enterprises, where I'm not sure um, that you would create envy, for instance, and sabotaging act again, hampering the co-creation. I'm just kind of wondering, because obviously that seems not to be happening there. How do they navigate? How do they make sure that there still is a cooperation and collaboration across these micro enterprises, but also within? So the, um, let me start saying that they came to this design that we, uh, we are seeing today after quite 40 years, they went through six transformations, massive transformations. And that's already a trait. So if you think that uh, guessing the right model would be the answer, probably you're wrong. And even today, what they say is that there is no model. So I hear China is different from uh, General Electric's appliances. That's the company they bought in the US. And uh, GA is different from I in Europe. So what they have really is a philosophy, I would say, uh, based on yeah, a number of principles, both from the East and, uh, and the West, and then some uh, organizational artifacts. So at the end, they offer some, uh, some tools to the people in the organization to work, uh, to work together. Uh, it's not more pres pre prescriptive than, than this. Even the EMC, um, so this collaboration contract, it's not... Uh, it's not uh, an organizational structure, it's a contract, a contract encoded in a, in a blockchain. So it's, uh, it's really dynamic. It's something different uh, from what we have seen. 
came out uh, as an idea from the organization itself. So some team said, we want to collaborate. How can we make this easier? Let's uh, find the construct that uh, will make it easier. Um, there is no competition within the team, within uh, the migrant enterprise. The migrant enterprise is really a team with a specific, uh, uh, what they call it, uh, valuation adjustment mechanism. So they get some money, they establish some goals, uh, some um, outcomes, and they work together very intensively uh, in doing that as a team with different competencies. So uh, with multidisciplinary competence. So um, really just to, um, because I'm a little bit, I find it so interesting. I want to drill down a little bit more here. Um, so let's forget about within the team, because obviously um, there we don't have that polarity, but between the teams. Now you're saying yeah. they create the contracts. Now contracts are usually something which is contractable. So it's often more a transactional thing and has nothing to do very often because, I mean, we have been having that in holding structures for a long time already, this problem. Uh, it's nothing that uh, captures the emerging, the synergy, um, those investments which you cannot um, know beforehand what you have to do in order to really come up together with something completely new, for instance. So. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm just wondering, is it just the contracts or is it anything else which makes them also really work together on long term um, projects which would bring the company further, which I would kind of say are co-creation acts? I, I, I tend to disagree that uh, through a contract you cannot achieve that and the contract could be a few months, it could be forever uh, or many, many years. Uh, and what they mean with a contract uh, is that every micro enterprise exposes a catalog of services. So my team would say, I'm able to do this, 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 and this. And uh, you can decide to buy those services from me or to buy the services from the market. This is a way to maximize collaboration. So knowing that uh, the company can do something, people in the company can do something, it's a way for others to leverage the service and to build something bigger at the benefit of the of the user and let me say this uh, this is mandatory because if you fragment a company nobody would be able to guarantee the experience uh, that the complex uh, changing fluid experience that uh, a user wants so you must do that uh, if you want to generate uh, the kind of value that IR wants to generate there is not a product yeah, so this is marketable. That's all marketable. I can understand that completely. That with contracts you can really have marketable uh, issues solved. But as, if we go into the realm which is not, um, uh, you don't know it now. It's not yet a product. It's not yet a service. But you have to co-create it together. Then you tend to run. I mean, the big holding companies run into problems. So I'm just kind of trying to find out because I believe they have found a way. But I think, um, Emanuele, I think there was another element here which comes into play, which is some when people create new projects and actually through that bidding mechanism, if I recall what you, what you explained yeah. to us, create new things. So maybe that is more to this innovative, creative part that Antoinette is pointing at. But the, the contract is not about how to do things. It's about what you want to achieve, the how, it's left entirely to, 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 to the people involved in the contract. And even the people, as Otti was saying, involved in the contract uh, aren't decided top down. So what you say is I want to uh, provide these new services. I think that there are some ingredients needed. I put it in a platform and people will flock to, to this and then we will talk and see who is best qualified, who has time, uh, who provides the best conditions. To work together so it's really a free decision left uh, actually desired uh, by the people in the organization so they desire to join it's not mandated it's not uh, so dry as it could uh, look by saying uh, a contract and it's very dynamic at the end uh, you must th think that uh, you have thousands and thousands of contracts uh, at any point in time so this is not uh, you know uh, a perfect city it's really a village with, uh, with thousands and thousands of people coming together in different forms to serve, uh, I would say, to, to bet on possibilities. So they are making bets. They are 
feeling that something is needed, they figure out how to make it. And it could work, it could fail. And failure is really part of the picture. They, they, they want to do this. So there is an expectation. And the key point is what you do when things fail. So failure is not seeing as we see in some cultures as you know uh, a problem or uh, a reason for punishment. It is a learning, it's really a learning, it's just a condition even a frequent condition into 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 work so the organization is no longer somebody telling you what to do it's people figuring out themselves uh, what to do autonomously or or uh, together and let me conclude by saying i understand that this may not be what everybody desires uh, i understand that uh, many of us maybe want to be directed want to feel safer want to, to 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 have the work prepared for them and that's uh, that's perfect this may not be uh, uh good in in higher so yeah maybe higher is not attracting these people higher has to, thousands of managers to go and find a role in the migrant enterprises so it was even a strong uh, action um and that's a decision it's part of those nudges uh, the constraints that we uh, discussed before so they see the organization with some kind of role and they attract people that want to play this role yeah no but um, i think i also heard other things in here next to the contracts and the bidding mechanisms because we went back to the cultural baseline or the philosophical baseline forbearance i think is one of the main principles um again of taoism in that case but it is also of this company of course um and so because i see other organizations which are also kind of very similar decentralized empowering flat fluid egalitarian consensual all the things which are important bit but which then for instance, pay a premise on helpfulness. So there seems to be some cultural norms that make it easier um, besides the contract that you are re really willing to try out things together, even though you never know whether it's going to bring you personally something, because that I believe is what collaboration is also very important. Yeah, um, right. to, to, to give another example, Zappos is coming from Totally different space, culture, country, journey, and uh, surprisingly similar to Ayer. Uh, they used holography before, and then they went into something called customer um, based dynamics. Uh, different names, but similar. You still have small teams, lots of autonomy, uh, with a profit and loss, collaborating with each other. But they have very different expectations. So if you want values from, from people, you are not required to be an entrepreneur. You can be, but they don't even expect everybody to be an entrepreneur. Actually, they value people working the team that has been launched by an entrepreneur. And uh, they have a set of values uh, that are really customer focused. Uh, and I would say that uh, go beyond in terms of metrics, uh, just simply profit. But it's very similar. So to me, the point is that, uh, as it happened also with holography and sociography, you can use the same dynamics, applying it uh, in totally different context, context, in a different culture, achieving totally different outcomes. What I really care in this case is uh, having a mechanism to distribute power and to recombine the action of thousands of people without hierarchy. To me, this is very powerful. The culture, the values that uh, you infuse into this, and also how you measure success. So it doesn't mean that profit should be the only measure. And we are all we already seeing other companies using random AE, measuring success, for example, in terms of personal development, together with profit, uh, which change everything. So again, we have a tool, we have an example, culture in a place uh, we shouldn't copy that uh, we should learn from it uh, and and tailor it to what we want to see into the world i would kind of really like to make that an important point um, for everybody listening out there because i think that is so valid we cannot just go and copy a model um, first of all what we have learned it's much more complex um, than um, a superficial thought it is 
I mean, I think that's the, or the first view it is. And second of all, they're all embedded, these models. And I think this is so important what you were just saying. And I also find it personally quite interesting to understand a little bit more because in your human map, you are having all these polarities, but um, just by kind of teasing out one of these and how you navigate that uh, made it clearer to me how that could look then um, also for other organizations. I found that really very interesting. And maybe on that notion, what we, I think we, we can crunch up this section and then briefly look at yeah. leadership. I think, I mean, Emanuele is super interesting. I, what, what came out for me, I'm almost thinking that you started by saying good organization probably plays out at different levels. And I think it's also reflected in your personal history to a degree. So that's the individual flourishing and desire for autonomy. There's a, an organizational compound, which I heard strongly in the sociocrat sociocratic world, where the community and feeling part of the group mm -hmm. is, is emphasized. And then I think we are all aiming for you said it a few times, not quite sure how, but the organization as an actor in terms of purpose, in terms of its governance, should be a, a positive contributor to the energy of the system. So we have these three levels, and it almost deems to me that what you're describing in, in um, Rendon Hagi leads to a maximization of the autonomy layer for the individual and the, the nurturing of entrepreneurship whilst at the same time introducing a few mechanisms for that collective community building. But I think what you're doing with your EEO construct and also bringing some sociocratic elements in is actually probably re-emphasizing that a little bit more than you naturally find it in that, at least from a Western perspective, right, in that, in that model. And, and I think the elements that for me stand out, like you explained, is the interaction inside the circle and also the decision making by consent, which I think is a really fundamental part of that model. But also, I really think the anchor and mission circle, which makes sure that there is some endorsement of that greater stakeholder benefit that you pointed out at the beginning. And then I think what we haven't got a good solution for, and maybe interesting to talk to Colin Meyer and some other people, even in the, in the kind of business ethics world, is this this overarching governance layer. So what are the solutions to, is it just setting a new purpose? Should we change the legal structures? Should we change the articles of incorporations? What are the options there? Also people like Graham Boyd, I think will join us in that conversation, right? So I think that is what I'm taking away from this. And I understand why I think you're bringing, you said you're, you're merging some of the different methodologies to come to something which starts to crystallize your vision of what really could become a, a hopeful organization. But maybe Antoinette, what are your key takeaways and then Emanuele to close out this part and then let's quickly look at leaders. Well, I almost already did it. To me, it is that there will not be this one hopeful organization for Emanuele, but there will be several hopeful organizations. And I find that really, really helpful that there is even an added layer of complexity be it a national culture, be it the more, you call it nudging, but I think nudging is also purposefully done. So looking even a little bit more into this nudging and attractor aspects. And in the end, that means for all CEOs, um, hopefully not CEOs only in the future, if we take your systems um, seriously, that we need to really be um, very mindfully creating the system for our context. Um, and hopefully one which has a narrative of hope and goodness. But I think this is, to me, what you really very strongly brought across here. And my sentence about this is uh, when you go for a transformation, you have to be mindful of what we are just saying, because it means uh, there is no target or grading model. There is no big design up front. Uh, the only... Uh, way of evolving more than transforming a line what we are describing is iterative is co-created is based on pilots uh, with a model that will be messy that will keep uh, evolving uh, and and that uh, at the end should yes implement uh, that uh, hope uh, and purpose we have been describing uh, in a few steps of this of this conversation. So the process uh, of organization design or organizational change is really different uh, from what uh, many firms have uh, have experienced. And uh, I don't believe in God, but I believe you need to you need faith 
to, to go through this journey because it means uh, you have to trust the system to eventually achieve the outcomes it wants to, to, to achieve. There is no guarantee in terms of the quality or the timing of those, those outcomes. And this is scary. So organizations should really go a bit deeper into this and then, um, and then take a bit of a leap of faith uh, into, into, into this. But again, this is becoming less and less a choice. It's becoming more and more of a, of a need. Very interesting. And I would say maybe, Antoinette, um, if you want to lead us into the final section. So Emanuele already started to talk about transformation is different to maybe the traditional way of uh, changing companies. Um, do you want to start there and then get uh, views on, on leadership in this context? Um, yeah, I think um, I just take up what you already started, um, and that is the transformation journey. And um, if you had a very traditional company, uh, what would you say is where would they have to start first? What has to go out first and to come in first? Uh, it, it's funny because we are. I'm having these conversations daily. Last one this morning, and uh, that's the only kind of organization I'm working with. Um, the first question that has to be addressed for me is the why. Why? Why do you want to do this? Maybe this is not uh, you know the solution. This is not for you. This is not for you now. There are many reasons for not doing it. I believe the, the answer, the only viable answer is uh, because of my people and because of my business. So if you find this kind of journey value for you, specifically in your context, trajectory, uh, business space, uh, well, okay, uh, that's good. Let's, uh, let's get started. This is uh, usually a step. It's not given for granted. This is really far from what most organizations have been seeing, whether that's a sociocracy, holacracy, or, or even more renown. Most organizations uh, uh, just freaked out, uh, freak out when they see this. So translating all of this in terms of the people and business benefits they could have is the starting point. The second point is where I should start. I, I wouldn't ever go with a big bank transformation. So let's uh, let's just disrupt everything, my business, um, my my organization, and build uh, a friendly like model. Uh, what we do as Bandares is going through a process in which the organization itself co-creates a portfolio of pilots. So decides where they want to start experimenting. They create a list of experiments, and then they co-design what's happening in each one of those experiments. So it's not the entire organization uh, altogether is in uh, small bites, small but meaningful bites, because those pilots uh, are really meant uh, to generate the transition from pilot to scale. So if you have 50,000 people, 80,000 people, you need to decide where to experiment and what you can learn, what you should, it's like an hypothesis. So it's like a really experiment. You make some assumptions and then you need to validate those assumptions and transform those learnings into the version 0, 0, 0, 001 of uh, you know, a new model that will keep uh, evolving. So it's uh, an iterative process in which the risk is relatively small, the need should be very high, and then you have to bring the organization along to learn in the, in the, in the field. And the, and the last uh, uh, thought I want to share is that, uh, yes, it's a, it's a pilot, but uh, you cannot just take uh, three, five, ten people in isolation and do the pilot with them. Because what the Renane is telling us is that uh, you need uh, colleagues from the rest of the organization giving you the services, HR, IT, legal, or other business services to succeed. So it's not uh, a pilot uh, based on hierarchy. It's a pilot uh, cutting across hierarchy. It's more but cutting across hierarchy. Uh, so, you can control the risk, uh, but you have to be serious about, uh, about uh, this because you need to explain to your organization why you are bothering. Um, in my experience, this could scale quite quickly and it could deliver results quite, uh, quite quickly. Not all the organizations are ready. Let me ask you, uh, as a follow-up to this, two quick questions. One, 
Antoinette is very often talking about blockers or things that thwart kind of the the thriving and the the the, the aliveness of the system. Right? So so what are the things that really become stumbling stones that that really in the traditional organization can can kill this in in any regard? But and then secondly, connected to that, before we go to leadership, what what is it that is there for the employees to actually become ready, capable, willing to step up into this space where they become almost like micro entrepreneurs? So, so what are the, the what are the requirements on the individual? What are the what are the blockers at the at the organizational level that you see? Uh, let, let's start from the bloggers. Uh, I think uh, there is plenty, really plenty. Uh, just an example, we are talking about micro enterprises. Uh, to, we can translate it as, uh, I'm going to take your, own, your people from your team, take them out from your control and use them for something else. Really? My people, I'm the boss, I have goals and you want to take my people. So already, you know, uh, the internal forces are uh, are coming together to fight you, or you are a support function with plenty of freedom so far. Now you have to be accountable for the quality and cost of your services uh, as if you are working with a customer, or you are a manager, and tomorrow morning uh, there is no longer anything to manage or anybody to manage. So there are plenty of reasons for not doing it and plenty of uh, uh, our force is going against this. That's why you have to be serious in business terms because otherwise uh, somebody will kill it uh, quite quickly. Um, uh, what, what for people? Um, I think there is a huge potential. I really see millions of people waking up every morning, morning uh, feeling unseen by the organization. They are just a number. Uh, okay, they talk about me at the end of the year when it's about the performance review. Uh, from time to time, my manager can tell me what to do. But at the end, the individuals are not human beings. They're just cogs in the machine. What uh, the Renanay is offering uh, is uh, some uh, orders of magnitude more uh, levels of freedom. So you can decide what to do how to do it, uh, with whom you want to do it, and even how much you want to be paid at a cost, of course, of having skin in the game. Uh, to me, this is powerful for some people. It may be not the best solution for, for, for others, but the potential is motivation. It's definitely returns, even hard uh, returns. It's, uh, it's mastery. So you have the possibility to bid, so to decide what you want to do in the organization, not to have HR or a boss telling you, but picking what you want to do and changing it. Uh, you, can, uh, you can become uh, not an employee, but an owner. So you can transition into something else that is closer to what we were discussing at the beginning. So the idea of a society in which we will have less employees and more people free to pick the kind of work, meaningful work they want to have, still having some security because you will have momentum traction in terms of work. This is what I'm envisioning, not necessarily what Iyer is, is, is doing, but projecting this at a global scale. I think we're going to liquefy the market a bit and to create more transparency and opportunities for people that want to pick and to be mindful in terms of the work they can uh, they can do uh, it also creates stress of course for people that are comfortable in their chair cool i don't know and um following then closing and let until you want to jump in i would close with the leadership question here so you've already talked a lot about the the bosses cannot just be bosses anymore the managers find themselves without stuff to manage so is this a completely leaderless organization or is everybody a leader or what does it mean for the the old leaders and what does it mean for leadership so to speak in the new context maybe just in a few sentences what, what's your view and Antoinette come in yeah maybe just drilling it a little bit more down because I think we already understood that um, hierarchy is part of the problem so maybe that is not the way um, uh, to elaborate here um, but more what 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 do you expect from leadership in general 
I think it's a very different kind of leadership, more leadership, but not less, first of all, more responsibility, not less, and more distributed responsibility, not uh, more centralized, but a different kind of leadership. And I would say uh, Zhang Rimin, higher CEO, but many others uh, are adamant about that. Uh, it, it's a leadership uh, that I will call an architecting leadership. So the leadership is acting more on the enabling constraints than on the people, than on the structure, than on the outcomes. Um, and uh, eventually, even the architecting could be crowdsourced. In sociocracy, what people do is uh, doing the work, but also designing uh, how the work uh, happens. And that's one of the reasons for which we use sociocracy on top of the RENNA, just to add this uh, possibility of the system designing the system. It takes lots of uh, humbleness. So as a leader, basically you are empowering others uh, through the right mechanisms more than uh, energizing them, uh, more than uh, coordinating them, more than uh, uh, rewarding them. Um, but, uh, but this is an important role. One problem that all these organizations have is what is going to happen when the leader will leave the company, will retire, will unfortunately die, whatever. And unfortunately, this is exactly what happened in Zappos. Tony Shea, that has been uh, you know, the, the mind and the heart uh, behind the, this, this fantastic story, uh, passed away. And many of them don't have an answer. They're just hoping things will go well. And uh, I believe that the leadership uh, is really connected to ownership, is really connected to purpose, because it's about uh, trying to transcend yourself and transcend leadership uh, and give this leadership at the system, letting the system own the system itself uh, at the service of purpose. That's uh, the highest level. Uh, so the, the, the CEO, the president, the board are instruments uh, into uh, the service of, 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 this, uh, of this idea. And this is a big problem if you have a big ego, as most leaders you know, have, if they became leaders in traditional organizations. Uh, this is very I challenging. Back to the traditional organizations, I find very interesting. So it's a, a lot of contextual leadership. It's creating the right... Um, um structures not structures in in the strictest sense but um practices enabling and so on but what i haven't heard yet and i think you had it um by uh, the egos maybe in there are there also some humane qualities you're looking for or is that not important is this no definitely uh, i think all of these people jang rimin uh, tony shea chris ruffer at the end bring themselves into into the company so more or less uh, intentionally uh, they express themselves uh, so their human traits their preferences their beliefs uh, uh, patagonia is another example in which the organization is really the vehicle for uh, achieving the the, the the bigger goods because the, the the founder believed that people had to go surfing right and because the company should be supporting uh, uh, um, environmental let's say improvements and this is the connection with purpose so if purpose is the beacon the leader that created the purpose or the leader that is joining to serve the purpose will be again an instrument and it's about who he or she or she is and again in this kind of organizations there is no script so you bring yourself uh, in implementing the purpose or I'll doing the work them again if i hear that it's a lot of authentic leadership that's what yes. i have here and of course i was trying to find out whether there's also something like care and compassion but uh, it's okay i was just kind of very curious so i think you explained it very well what's in your back authentic for sure uh Caring, I hope, but uh, to me, not uh, not necessarily. It depends on the it depends on the organization. And again, uh, every individual can pick then the organization if uh, the kind of leadership fits with his or her own expectation. Let me close on this one and then briefly crunch it up and finish off. So, Emanuele, with that notion, everybody can pick. 
right? So you left the big four, so to speak, uh, to go on a journey of discovery, but also of uh, having more impact and, and trying and experimenting. So let, let, let me ask you the question after what you've seen to the endless amounts of people you've spoken and so on. Which company, if the CEO called you tomorrow morning and said, Emanuele, I want you to join this thing because it's exactly what you need, kind of which company would you be ready to join now that you've seen so many of them? There is no one I can think of, to be sincere. And, uh, <laughs> and not, not because there are not good companies or interesting companies, but because I really care about my own freedom and my own ability to make more than, uh, than one, but also the, uh, the curiosity I have, and I believe we should have in this time. It's really a time in which, uh, if you believe to have found the solution, for sure you're wrong. Uh, and there is so much to, to learn about instead. I, I see this condition missing in most companies, even in the best companies, you will learn about a specific culture, a specific mindset, a specific approach. Uh, that's not what I want. I, I want to pick, compare and mix uh, and to enable others to do, to do the same. So plenty of good examples, but, uh, no place in which I would like to spend the rest of my life. Which is telling, right? Which is also telling because I think to a degree, organizations allow us to create things that we couldn't create by ourselves. And hence there is a, an a societal desire to connect individuals into something to amplify their authentic abilities, right? So, and you're still there saying, I know I'm not going to join anyone. I want to do my own thing and look at lots of things. With many of them though. So with many of them, that's, uh, you don't need to be in to learn and co-create uh, with uh, with them that's uh, that's 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 the point mm, okay i let it i think we will repeat this interview in a few years and see if you've changed your Let's mind see. on this or not but let me now lead it into the closure quickly it was a i mean what an exciting conversation i really enjoyed it and i think for people listening it probably also shows how many open questions we all still have and someone like you emmanuele having pondered about this for 20 years so it's, it's I think it's an exciting space and it's the right space to be in to hold some of these questions. And on the question side, so our usual checkout, usual after the second call now, so to speak, is a 60 second quiz. So I will just throw a few questions at you for short answers. Um, let me start you with the following. So to learn more about good organizations, whatever the good means, I would rather have dinner with the CEO of Hire, probably again, Read Spiral Dynamics or meet Ken Wilber again, or spend a year working in Patagonia. Which of the three would you choose? Uh, I would enjoy the dinner with Jan Guimini. Dinner with the CEO. Good businesses need the, one of the following. Good leaders, good rules, good practices, or something else. Good principles. Good principles. Sociocracy or holacracy? Sociocracy. I think we got that one. Um, humanocracy or teal? Uh, humanocracy, but uh, I will stay far from models, any model. Far from models. Um, cooperative, B Corp or public corporation? Um, cooperative, but, but, also, but also B Corps, I would say. Uh -huh. Both. Freedom or community? Both, why, why choosing? <laughs> Both, very good. And then finally, if I could change one thing in the world to make it a better place, I would do what? Uh, I would really help the system to rethink uh, the concept of value. I'm sure Paul Barnett would love this finishing act because he's always saying we need a new theory of values. Mm -hmm. So rethink the value I mean, for us, there's no doubt this has been a very valuable conversation and probably exhausting one for everybody listening. So, Emanuele, again, grazie mille. Thank you so much for having taken your time and explored these questions with us. Thanks a lot for everybody listening. It was a pleasure. Hang on in there and hopefully speak to you on the next one of these episodes. Emanuele, again, thank you very much. And speak to you soon. Thank you so much.